بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس ویلکم ٹو دا سیکنڈ لیکچر آف انٹروڈکشن ٹو بائی انفارمیٹکس کورس ان دا پریویس لیکچر وی ڈسکسڈ اباؤٹ دس فیلڈ دا فیلڈ آف بائی انفارمیٹکس اے بریف ہسٹری آف بائی انفارمیٹکس ڈفرنٹ مائل سٹونز اینڈ آلسو وی ڈسکسڈ ہاؤ دس فیلڈ اوورلیپس وتھ ٹریڈیشنل فیلڈ آف بایولوجیکل سائنسز اور ہاؤ ویٹ لیب اینڈ ٹرائل لیب دے کمپلیمنٹ ایچ ادر and today in this lecture we will discuss about biological databases but before we move towards biological databases i just want you to refresh in your memories at the central dogma of molecular biology so according to uh, the central dogma of molecular biology states that the flow of information is from dna to rna and from rna to proteins and in some cases uh, rna is first uh, uh, reverse transcribed into dna in some viruses okay so this is how the information is uh, information flows in a a biological system and uh, if we uh, you know enhance or uh, this central dogma uh, we can also say that there could also be a central dogma of bioinformatics where we uh, uh, talk about genomes and transcriptomes and proteomes you know at a larger scale so we have uh, genomics which is the study of structure function and expression of all the genes in an organism okay so in this field uh, not only we uh, study the, the structure function of uh, genes uh, in in one organism but also we compare different genomes with each other and if we talk about transcriptomics then it is the study of all of the you know um, rna that is being transcribed at a given uh, time point at a given condition so at at, at one time like if there are um, thousands of uh, rna being transcribed in a living cell in a cell system then uh, in transcriptomics we study all those uh, rnas um, together and then this there comes uh, proteomics which is a large scale study of proteins proteins including their structure and function within a cell system and organism and also uh, we can also uh, say that uh, we have metabolomics which is the study of global metabolite profiles in a system uh, that system can be a cell it can be a tissue or an organism and uh, the study of metabolite obviously will be uh, under a set of given conditions so we can say that they we can also you know say that there is a central dogma of bioinformatics uh, and this is such a powerful tool Uh, that uh, is being used uh, uh, these days and i'll just give you one example of um, this omics study uh, which is being conducted by the nasa and this is called the uh, the twins study so what uh, uh, did they do they uh, there were two astronauts they were both identical twins they were both brothers and they sent uh, one of them into the space and the other one was you know uh, was kept at ground and uh, the the astronaut that stayed in uh, that that was sent into the space uh, he stayed there for like uh, uh, one year okay and uh, during this time uh, period uh, they studied different you know uh, the parameters they compared different uh, things between um, the, the 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 astronaut at ground and astronaut on, in, in the space and they uh, analyzed uh, the the biochemical uh, features cognition epigenomics gene expression immune system metabolomics microbiome proteomics physiology and telomeres and just to uh, uh, give you some 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 you know uh, interesting uh, thing about the study is that when they studied the telomere uh, length uh, they uh, found out that when the astronaut went in the space Uh, his telomeres you know it shortened and uh, when the, the same astronaut when uh, he returned to the uh, to the earth his telomere length you know became you know normal again so this was very interesting but by uh, till now it's not known that what was the reason behind this uh, change in the telomere length but this is something you know uh, an interesting observation they uh, found out uh, so uh, it all uh, bef- so uh, geno- uh, if it, we are talking about genomics and proteomics and transcriptomics uh, at, at, at a larger scale but it you know there was a starting point uh, for this thing and for all this the starting point was the i would say the, the human genome project 
uh, which was um, initiated to identify all the genes in a human DNA and to determine the sequence of three billion bases that make up the human DNA okay and the other uh, I mean feature of that human genome project was to to store this information in a database in databases so that that can be used by a scientist around the globe so for the human genome project 18 different countries you know they participated with significant contributions from USA UK Germany France Japan and China the goals of human genome project were straightforward uh, after the completion of genome uh, human genome project uh, we, we, we would have this ability to alert patients that are at risk of uh, certain diseases because you know uh, there are certain diseases that are due to some genetic factors because of some faulty genes and once uh, we have uh, identified all the genes and once we have mapped all the genes uh, in the genome uh, now we can you know easily uh, you know a sequence a DNA of someone and compare it with the a reference genome to see that if the gene is fine if the gene has some anomaly or not okay so one of the goal of human genome project was to alert the patient that are risk of uh, certain diseases and uh, secondly uh, reliably predict the course of a disease and precisely diagnose diseases and ensure the most effective treatment that is nowadays known as personalized medicine okay so uh, this human genome our project has enabled us to you know move in the direction of personalized medicine where each person is treated as unique and their uh, problems or their diseases are being you know uh, treated according to, to their uh, needs and requirements and obviously um, developing new treatments at the molecular level so uh, the more we know about uh, the molecular details uh, the more you know we can you know move forward in the direction of treatments at the molecular level okay so uh, if we have uh, uh, you know uh, get a chance we will discuss this more in detail in our QA sessions so the whole genome sequencing strategies that were used in human genome project uh, is shown in in the flow chart here so in the early phase of human genome project uh, the use transposon based random insertions in clone DNA but uh, with, with with the you know advancement in the uh, sequencing strategies then uh, you know the project was shifted to the more modern approach that is known as the shotgun uh, sequences and what happens in shotgun sequence is that there is a large piece of DNA and that DNA is then fragmented into smaller pieces and those smaller pieces that are you know being generated they are uh, I mean they are generated in redundant amount of sequence data from uh, random fragments okay so a large number of random fragments are generated and then each random fragment was uh, that is being generated in the previous step was sequenced and after sequencing then those pieces were then you know um, placed uh, together just like a puzzle we discussed in our previous QA session also how uh, this this worked so this was the modern approach of uh, sequencing the main uh, characteristic uh, characteristics of you know human genome are summarized here uh, in, in, in this figure uh, the human genome is composed of 2.3.2 giga base pairs okay or 3.2 billion base pairs and out of this 3.2 GB 1.1% uh, consists of exons means 1.1% uh, of the uh, genome encodes for uh, proteins sometimes you also say that you know 2% of the uh, DNA codes for proteins and 24% of the genome consists of introns that are the region in between two exons and 75% of the sequence or 75% of the DNA consists of intergenic uh, sequences means this, the, the, the sequence between two different genes is known as intergenic sequence so this is the 
um, summary of uh, you know what they found out in uh, human genome or how human genome can be you know uh, divided into exons introns and intergenic region in terms of percentage and if we talk about general features so uh, these are the features uh, 3.2 billion base pairs were sequenced and computationally predicted genes were more than 43,000 and uh, known protein coding genes they are you know over more than 22,000 uh, protein coding genes and 12,300 uh, genes were you know classified classified as pseudo genes uh, nine thousand more uh, approximately ten thousand genes were you know those that in encoded for RNA and you know numerous number of SNPs were also you know identified uh, from the human genome project uh, then also uh, there, there, there's origin of mouse genomics like uh, just like human genome project uh, it there were you know five different model organisms that were associated with human genome project means that uh, with the human genome project uh, five other model organism sequencing projects were also initiated in parallel and they contained uh, mouse genome yeast genome uh, fruit fly genome worm genome and e coli genome so uh, apart from human genome these five different org uh, organisms were also you know sequenced and they are also known as the model organisms and if you talk about mouse genome uh, that was being um, sequenced by mouse genome sequencing consortium uh, and there were four different partners uh, for human mouse genome sequencing um, that are shown in in this figure and as for the mouse genome, you can see that approximately 23,000 were, uh, you know, protein coding genes and 130 genes were novel protein coding genes. Uh, more than 4,000 were pseudo genes and so on and so forth. So you can see that a lot of information was being uh, generated. A lot of information was generated uh, with this uh, completion of human genome project and mouse genome project and four other uh, model organism genome project. Okay, so uh, a lot of data was, you know, generated. Uh, if you remember, in the first lecture, we one of the definition that we studied or we discussed about bioinformatics was the union of biology and bioinformatics, where bioinformatics involves the technology that uses computer for storage, retrieval, manipulation, and distribution of information. Okay, so now you can, you know, uh, understand that. Uh, uh, with, with the example of human genome project and you know five other model organism genome project and till now there are thousands of organisms have been you know sequenced so far so there's tons of data uh, present um, and and is being generated every day and now the problem is how to store that information in a meaningful way uh, storage is important retrieval retrieval is impor important you know and distributing the information um, all over the globe to the scientist is uh, you know something that is very important uh, because uh, just gathering the information is not uh, important uh, using uh, I mean digging out meaningful information from that uh, I mean turning that information into knowledge is uh, what is um, what we, 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 we what we want to do okay so now the problem came to how to store the uh, information so uh, obviously uh, to store the information uh, we, we know that we need databases a database you know we have in in our life we used a lot of databases the simplest example of a database can be the phone directory that we used to have at homes uh, where we used to have a person's name and its uh, and his phone number and his address in in that phone directory so a database is a collection an organized collection of related information okay so there are two important terms here a uh, database is an organized collection okay so it the, the, the data must be organized and the second thing uh, thing is that the data should be related to each other okay so uh, a database having you know uh, unrelated information is not a good database and what are the advantages of using a database? 
the first one is easy and quick retrieval of information and sec secondary advantage is the provide backup support and uh, uh, if we talk about biological databases so we need to collect and store biological data and its associated knowledge into databases now what do we mean uh, mean by you know biological data and its associated knowledge so biological data is uh, we can simply say that uh, the sequence of a dna sequence of rna sequence of proteins uh, structure of a protein okay so this all this this all you know um, represents the biological data but what is the associated knowledge like okay if we know the sequence of a uh, strand of dna a stretch of dna uh, does that stretch of dna contain any gene or does it um, does that stretch of dna contain any regulatory sequences now this is the associated knowledge and a database should have both these information both biological data and its associated knowledge then we'll be able to you know add into that knowledge and this is obviously fundamental to the survival of science if we don't do it we cannot survive or we cannot you know move ahead uh, you know in science and because of this you know there are some journals last like nucleic acid research uh, that dedicates an entire issue uh, on databases each year uh, so this shows that how important these biological databases are and uh, mostly we will be the ones who will be using the databases uh, very often and we'll have um, more in-depth knowledge when we'll be doing some uh, online practicals uh, we'll be using different databases and digging out different information from those databases okay so uh, a biological database can be divided into three you know uh, forms uh, uh, they can it can be classified into primary database or secondary database or specialized database we'll discuss one by one all three kinds of databases the first one is the primary database now the primary database is a database where information comes directly from uh, some author or some person so suppose a person has sequenced a dna or sequenced a genome he will you know upload the sequence into the uh, database and that sequence will be accessible from you know by, by you know uh, by different people around the world so a primary database consists of primary data okay it uh, the data that is being uh, you know generated at different sources and that those data uh, you know will be uh, put together in a database that is accessible to different people uh, primary database you know they, they contain the original biological data as we have just discussed and it archives the raw sequences or structural data so uh, some of the examples of primary databases are genbank uh, EMBL or uh, DDBJ. EMBL is the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, and DDBJ is the DNA Data Bank of Japan. So these are uh, the examples of primary databases that are for genome sequencing sequences. Okay, and similarly for protein sequences, we have primary databases known as SwissProt and PIR. PIR, PIR is the Protein Information Resource and we also have a database for protein structures why this is important because you know that the structure of proteins is is uh, important and the structure of a protein uh, describes the function of a protein okay so we have a complete uh, we have a whole uh, database just for the protein structures uh, which is a pdb or uh, protein database and these uh, databases like genbank embl ddbj these three databases they uh, you know collaborate very closely with each other so every day they you know um, uh, share the information that is being updated and uh, you will find the information um, i mean same information in three different databases but uh, there might be a different representation style so in one of the database the data will be represented in one form or in in one way and in the other database it will be it might be you know uh, shown in some other way but the data will be the same so these three databases the information can overlap uh, and it, it will overlap okay because they are working in close collaboration uh, then we have uh, composite databases composite databases is basically a collection of uh, primary databases uh, 
so when uh, a lot of databases they are combined together uh, they become a composite database and uh, the, the the advantage of a composite database is that it eliminates the need to search each one separately and each composite database has different search algorithms and uh, data structure so uh, every time uh, I mean when when I talk about composite databases the uh, example that comes into my mind is is a is a uh, Android application or mobile application known as uh, WeChat that we used to uh, use you know a few years ago uh, that this is a, a mobile app which has you know a lot of functions in it so it it's it is connected with your bank so you don't have to you know log into your bank account and you know do the transactions you can easily you know transfer money from your app to the bank and the same app is also connected with the uh, ticking ticketing system of buses and railways and it you can also buy you know uh, movie tickets and you can do some shopping and a uh, lot of information uh, I mean uh, uh, features are there okay so that app becomes a super app and uh, with that app there's no need or there's a you know very um, uh, there's no need of you know having too many apps in your mobile phone so just one app will be necessary for your day-to-day -day task okay so uh, a composite database uh, similarly has um, you know uh, when when primary databases they come together and uh, it helps you to you know stay at one place and you can you know access each and every information uh, there are different uh, composite databases that we will be you know discussing in our lab part we have mesh database omim pubmed snp uh, gene genomes book so these are all you know different databases that are you know uh, put together in NCBI which is a very powerful resource uh, that we will be using in our lab sessions then we have secondary databases secondary databases comes uh, you know when uh, be because the primary data is um, yeah, most of it is information so you want to transform that information into uh, some knowledge okay so if you have a sequence of a DNA okay that's that's something uh, that's an information but we want to add into that information and uh, by you know some computational predictions and doing some experiments we can find out okay uh, uh, where in the genomes the genes are located where are the intergenic regions where are the introns uh, where are the SNPs all this uh, you know information uh, is then you know added to the uh, primary data and when the database contains associated knowledge uh, about primary data also then it becomes a secondary database okay so uh, uh, secondary databases are computationally processed or manually curated information based on information from primary databases so information is coming from the primary database and then we are you know computationally processing it or manually you know curating the information and the uh, some of the examples of secondary databases we have SCOP, we have CATH, ProSight, uh, SwissProt. Okay, so these are all examples of secondary databases. We'll try to, uh, you know, uh, discuss this uh, in more detail in our uh, lab sessions. Uh, then the third type of database, major type of database, is a specialized database, and the specialized database serves a specific research community. Okay. So suppose you are uh, you are scientist and you are working with uh, a model organism C. elegans, or if you are a scientist who who are you know uh, who is more interested in uh, investigating the expression of microRNAs. Okay, so you uh, you can create a database that is you know specifically uh, serving uh, your needs. Okay, so we have some databases such as Flybase. This is for uh, those people uh, who are working with, you know, uh, model organism Drosophila melanogaster. So in the fly-based database, you will get each and every information of Drosophila. Similarly, in worm-based or worm book, this, uh, I remember one of, uh, in our lab, people, they used to call it the, uh, the Bible of, you know, C. Um, uh, elegans, that you'll, you, you'll, you'll get each and every information of worm C. elegans in uh, of this database so it becomes specialized it becomes specialized and it's it will serve a group of people who are working in that direction okay so if you are my, uh, working you know suppose if you are working in proteins on proteins then uh, mere DB is not a good option for you to you know 
look for okay so you will be moving into the uh, some protein database okay so these are the general uh, categories and uh, how different bi uh, biological databases can be you know uh, defined uh, what are primary databases secondary databases and um, specialized databases so inshallah we will be discussing these uh, databases uh, more in our practical sessions uh, this is uh, it for for this lecture okay so from the next lecture we'll uh, move towards the uh, uh, sequence alignment and that stuff so please uh, uh, go through these databases uh, find some information uh, about these databases and then we'll discuss this in our QA session and in the lab sessions till then Allah Hafiz